My name is Tom Keynes, and uh, really I want to view this as the great adventure, pediatric pulmonary physiology. It's designed really for pulmonary fellows or pulmonologists who want to go into a bit more depth than uh, usually happens. So we're going to spend more time, for example, talking about how some tests are measured. Enter this journey uh, like a kidney candy shop. I mean, this really is potentially exciting stuff. The respiratory system is the most elegant in design and function, as I hope to convince you. The lungs are exposed to the environment, unlike other organ systems, which brings on additional challenges. Lung disease is the leading cause of hospital admission, especially in pediatrics, and the ancient Greeks realized that the lungs were the seat of the soul, not the heart, eyes, or brain, but the lungs. Ralph Waldo Emerson, a famous American philosopher, said, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, that is to have succeeded. Sir Isaac Newton once said, if I seem to see further than others, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I just want to acknowledge for a moment mentors who literally changed my life. Gennaro Tizi, who was at uh, University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, my faculty advisor and the person who first inspired me to become interested in pulmonary physiology. Arnold uh, C.G. Platzker at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, who really guided me in my clinical training of pediatric uh, respiratory disorders and also gave me some important career advice. Uh, Drs. Henry Levison and A. Charles Bryan at the Research Institute of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, where I did my fellowship, really uh, enriched my uh, appreciation and enjoyment. These are the 30 lectures that we're going to be given, and now we'll go through these, but uh, we're going to start with an introduction. Laws of physiology. Pulmonary physiology is easier than it seems, otherwise I could not do it. Seek to understand pulmonary physiology, not to memorize it. Today, we're going to be talking about normal lung function, a brief overview of structure of the lungs, gas laws, O2 and CO2 transport in blood, cyanosis, and O2 and CO2 diffusion. There is a definition. The maintenance of normal arterial oxygen tension, PO2, carbon dioxide tension, PCO2, and pH without excessive cardiac or pulmonary work. And in order for gas exchange to occur, you need an adequate amount of ventilation, an adequate amount of perfusion, you need the ventilation to be distributed in the lungs where the perfusion is, and you need the ability of oxygen and CO2 to diffuse readily across the alveolar capillary membrane. In clinical medicine, the most important abnormality here is abnormalities in the distribution of ventilation, which we'll be talking about in quite a bit of detail. Next, uh, structure of the lungs. So this is the respiratory system which technically uh, includes the upper uh, respiratory sinuses, nasal passage, etc. But we're, for the most part, going to be focusing on from the trachea on down to the lungs, respiratory muscles, etc. Um, this would be an example of chest, two lungs here in the chest. Um, and we think about, uh, from a functional point of view at least, airways, of which there are 23 generations we'll talk about, and alveoli. So airways. Airways basically are categorized by generation. So the trachea is generation number zero. All right. The airways then bifurcate for the main stem bronchi, and this is generation number one. And as bifurcation continues, we go down to generation number 16. These are so-called conducting airways, meaning that no gas exchange occurs across the surface of these airways. And then 17 through 23, 23 is just adjacent to the alveoli, are respiratory bronchioles where gas exchange can, in fact, occur across the, the surface of that airway. Um, this is a more common diagram, but it basically shows the th same thing. Conducting airways, 0 to 13, 16, sorry, uh, respiratory bronchioles, 17 to 23. And again, the distinguishing features, conducting airways, no gas exchange, respiratory bronchioles, gas exchange can occur. So this is the structure of the airways of the trachea. This would be generation number one, two, et cetera. Um, and so let's talk about airways. So conducting airways, generation number zero through 16, 
Bronchi are large cartilaginous airways and their caliber is dependent primarily on smooth muscle tone. Bronchioles are large airways without cartilage and their caliber is dependent primarily on lung volume. So here's a photomicrograph of a uh, large conducting airway. And you can see that the wall here is thick with cartilage, for example, um, such that gas exchange really can't occur across that surface. The functions of these conducting airways are primarily to warm and humidify inspired air. They distribute inspired air to the uh, alveoli for gas exchange, but no gas exchange occurs across that surface. They also remove foreign material from inspired air reaching the alveoli, which we'll discuss down the road. And the volume of conducting airways is roughly 2 mLs per kilogram of ideal body weight. Respiratory bronchioles differ in that gas exchange does occur across the surface of that airway. Flow is laminar, and the uh, respiratory bronchioles receive oxygen and nutrients from the pulmonary circulation. So this is an example of a respiratory bronchial. And I think you can see that the wall of this uh, airway compared to the wall of alveoli is similar. And you can imagine that gas exchange can occur easily across uh, the wall of that airway. Alveoli. Alveoli are the site of most gas exchange. Adults have about 300 to 500 million alveoli, and oxygen and CO2 exchange is by diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane. This is a thin membrane, about 0.5 to 1 microns in thickness. And if we look at a photomicrograph of an alveolus or alveoli, you can see it's mostly air. Right? The walls of these alveoli although they contain some elastic tissues we will talk about, they're primarily sheets of blood that surround these airways. And the idea here is to get the maximum area available for gas exchange. You want the maximum area that blood basically is in contact with the air. Um, if we look at an electron micrograph, basically this is the alveolar space. There's an epithelial layer. There is an interstitial space, which is usually empty an endothelial layer, and then the pulmonary capillaries are such that the entire cardiac output is spread out to a sheet one erythrocyte thick. So you've got gas exchange that can occur from this side and from this side. We're maximizing the area available for gas exchange, which is the primary function of the lungs. This is about the best diagram I could find. This really doesn't show a sheet of blood, but the idea is that there is a lot of blood vessels um, around this alveoli, again, maximizing that area where blood is coming in contact with the alveolar capillary membrane and uh, gas exchange can occur. The um, alveolar surface area of adult lungs is generally described as 75 square meters, the size of a tennis court or 90 square yards. But here at the University of Southern California, we're perhaps more used to looking at this as the size of alveoli on the USC football field. So this, 90 square yards, is the area of one person's alveoli if it were spread out on the, on the football field. If there were 60 of you, um, you could completely cover the football field. So this is the area of alveoli in the lungs of an adult. Now, again, we want to maximize the area available for gas exchange. So let's imagine for a moment that we have a volume one liter, uh, a volume of one liter. If we had just one sphere, all right, that was one liter in volume, the surface area around that sphere available for gas exchange would be 484 centimeters squared. If we gradually increase the number of spheres but decrease the volume in each sphere, so the total volume here is still 1,000 mLs. We here have 1,000 uh, spheres of one mL each then the, the area of available gas exchange uh, increases dramatically. So we'd rather have a, small, a large number of small alveoli to increase surface area available for gas exchange rather than just one large alveolus of the same volume. Pleural anatomy, just so you know, uh, there are both uh, visceral pleura, which coat the lungs, parietal pleura, which uh, are uh, basically on the chest wall, and this forms a pleural space which can become a problem in some diseases, pneumothoraces, hemothorax, chylothorax, et cetera. So this is basically what the chest would look like. The heart is here, lungs here, et cetera. Unoxygenated blood returns 
to the heart through systemic veins to the right atrium, the left uh, goes to the right ventricle, and is pumped out in the pulmonary arteries to the lungs where the blood is oxygenated. Blood, oxygenated blood then returns through pulmonary veins to the left atrium, goes to the left ventricle where it's pumped out through the aorta and other systemic arteries to the body so that the body receives oxygenated blood. We will be talking about the wimpy heart and the majestic and elegant lungs, so this is perhaps the ideal chest with lungs but no heart. I hope you have a sense of humor. In the pulmonary circulation, pulmonary arteries on oxygenated blood follow airways. So as airways bifurcate, you can see that the pulmonary arteries also bifurcate and eventually get down to alveoli, gas exchange occurs, and then oxygenated blood returns through pulmonary veins by a different route. They do not follow the airways. Um, but this is oxygenated blood returning to the left heart. Bronchial arteries perfuse conducting airways. So this arises from the systemic circulation, which and the functions really are to heat and humidify inspired air in the conducting airways. Um, note that if you have problems with large airways, um, the vasculature perfusing these are systemic arteries at systemic pressures. So some diseases that can cause bronchiectasis and erosion into arteries can get you into big problems if you uh, open an artery at systemic pressure inside the lung. Let's talk about gas laws. So Evangelista Torricelli, 1608 to 1647. He is the first person that really talked about air pressure. He said, we live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of the element air, which by unquestioned experiments is known to have weight. Based on his observation, Otto von Guericke uh, of about the same time did a classic experiment where he evacuated this metal sphere so there was a complete vacuum in here, and two teams of horses could not pull this apart. Now, it's not that the vacuum was, was causing this, it's the weight of air around this that was compressing these that prevented the horses from doing this. Boyle's Law, Charles Law, and Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures are dry gas laws, right? Water vapor does not act like dry gases. Therefore, water vapor pressure, or pH2O, must be subtracted from barometric pressure. Water vapor pressure varies by temperature, and water vapor pressure is 47 tor, named after Evangelista Torricelli, but millimeters of mercury, at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, or 310 degrees Kelvin. So this is a water vapor chart. You can see uh, temperature in Celsius degrees, and we're generally interested in the pressure at 37 degrees body temperature, which is 47 torr or 47 millimeters of mercury. Boyle's law, if you have a sealed amount of gas, pressure times volume is a constant. So if we have a, a, a gas here, pressure one times volume one, and then we compress it, is gonna equal pressure two times volume two. Charles law, Charles law says that the volume divided by temperature is a constant. So if we have a gas here, sealed gas, and we now heat it, we increase both the temperature and the volume, and these increase proportionally. Note that lung volumes and flow rates are measured in a spirometer at room air, which is ambient temperature pressure saturated. We want to know the volumes and flows in the body at 37 degrees, which is body temperature pressure saturated. Now, for this equation and for the gas laws, the temperature is in degrees Kelvin, which is Celsius plus 273, all right? So if we want to, if we measure a certain volume at room temperature in a spirometer, and we not want to know what it is in the body, we basically have to correct by the temperatures in degrees Kelvin. So uh, that's just shown here. Um, ambient temperature pressure saturated would be what's measured in the room. Body temperature pressure saturated is the same amount of gas in the lungs, again, measured as degrees Kelvin. And again, in the good old days, or bad old days before computers, all pulmonary function labs used to have a so-called BTPS chart. And so what they did, they had a string of, of temperatures in Celsius of the room, 
and then the conversion factor of ATPS to BTPS. So, for example, ordinarily, people were talking about a room temperature of around 24 degrees Celsius, and that BTPS factor was 1.08, meaning that if you measured a vital capacity at room temperature, uh, you would have to multiply that by 1.08 uh, in order to get the same volume in the body at body temperature. So that's shown here as the most common, but it would in fact be whatever room temperature or temperature your spirometer is at. Most computerized systems uh, use pneumatax, which we'll be talking about, and inspired air is assumed to be at room temperature, ATPS. Exhaled air is assumed to be at body temperature, BTPS. When you inspire, this air is at ATPS and is going to need BTPS correction. Exhaled air, however, is already at body temperature, so it does not need BTPS correction because it's coming from the body at that temperature. All volumes and expiratory flow rates in pulmonary function testing are corrected to BTPS. However, when you want to know the absolute number of molecules, you need to correct to standard temperature pressure dry. And standard temperature pressure dry is 760 millimeters of mercury or TOR, zero degrees Celsius or 273 degrees um, Kelvin. Okay, and so basically this would be the formula. So your your um, volume here um, at STPD would be here, ATPS would be here, and to get volume in SP, STPD, it's the volume you measured at ATPS in your spirometer times barometric pressure times 273 divided by room temperature divided at times 760. In pulmonary function testing, and we'll discuss this more, the measures that you want in BTPS are total lung capacity, residual volume, vital capacity, inspiratory capacity, extratory reserve volume, inspiratory reserve volume, extratory reserve volume, tidal volume, functional residual capacity, residual volume, forced vital capacity, FEV1, FEV2, 75, and peak flow. The only things we're really concerned about the absolute number of molecules is the diffusing capacity. We want to know how much oxygen diffuses across that alveolar capillary membrane, oxygen consumption, and CO2 production, which generally are useful in exercise testing. So these are the ones that are corrected to STPD. Everything else is corrected to body temperature pressure saturated. Dalton's law of partial pressure. So if we look at air pressure, barometric pressure, the weight of a column of air above me, right? This is composed of several gases. So for example, it's composed of 79% nitrogen. So the partial pressure of nitrogen in air is the proportion of nitrogen, 0.79 times barometric pressure, minus water vapor pressure, remember. Similarly for oxygen, it would be uh, 0.21, 21% of um, barometric pressure minus water vapor and any other gases will be the same. These all add up to the total barometric pressure. Okay, so Dalton's law of partial pressures is the partial pressure of a gas is equal to the fraction of that gas uh, in air times barometric pressure. Physiologic notation, which we'll be utilizing throughout this course. So the first letter here is what we're talking about. So P would be pressure, partial pressure, F would be fraction, saturation, content, volume. The subscript, first subscript is the location. Capital letters indicate a gas phase. So capital A would be alveolar, exhaled, inspired, etc. Small letters indicate a liquid phase. So small A would be arterial, venous, or end capillary. And then the gas that we're talking about. So if we want to calculate the partial pressure of inspired oxygen at sea level, okay? It's going to be the fraction of inspired oxygen, 21%, times barometric pressure minus 47. Remember, we have to get rid of water vapor pressure, all right? Um, and then that's going to equal the partial pressure of inspired oxygen. So at sea level, this is going to be 0.21 times 760 minus 47, which is 713. And if you multiply that out, it's going to equal 150. So that is the partial pressure of inspired oxygen at sea level. Now in medicine, we can change the partial pressure of inspired oxygen by changing the fraction of inspired oxygen. 
And as you can see, if we increase the fraction of oxygen, barometric pressure obviously remains stable, right? But the greater the FiO2, the greater the PiO2 is going to be. So here, for example, if we use 40% oxygen, then the PiO2 is going to be 0.4, 40% of 760 minus 47, or 285, considerably higher than the 150 when breathing room air. The other way that the PiO2 can change is by going to altitude. Now, at altitude, the fraction of inspired oxygen is always 21%, but barometric pressure is what is decreasing. All right, so that if you're at, for example, 10,000 feet, you have a barometric pressure here compared to 760, all right? But 21% of that is the PiO2, and you can see this is gonna gradually decrease as well as this does. Again, back to Evangelista Torricelli, he said, we live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of the element air by which unquestioned experiments is known to have weight. He predicted that the weight of a column of air at altitude would be less than at sea level. And in fact, he measured barometric pressure at high altitude, and it was in fact lower. So if we take an example, let's look at uh, 2,225 uh, 2, meters or 7,300 feet elevation. The total bar barometric pressure there is 580. But remember, FiO2 is still 21%. So the partial pressure of inspired oxygen would be 21% of 580 minus 47, or 112 significantly lower than the 150 at sea level. Now, you can actually do a quick method to, um, to estimate uh, the PiO2 at altitude. If you know that for every thousand feet of altitude, your PiO2 decreases by five tor, all right? So uh, this just shows this in detail, you can see that this method actually is really pretty good up to about 10,000 feet. It starts to deviate a bit above that, but up to 10,000 feet, you can estimate PiO2 by this method of just subtracting five tor for each thousand feet of elevation, and you'll be in pretty good shape. The only other option would be to look it up on a uh, altitude chart. So the important thing about gas laws is that the partial pressure of a gas drives diffusion. Diffusion is the primary mechanism of gas transport in the respiratory system. Let's now talk about oxygen and CO2 transport in blood. There is oxygen dissolved in blood, and the O2 content uh, of dissolved oxygen is linear with respect to PO2, or pressure of oxygen. There are 0.003 mLs of oxygen dissolved per deciliter per tor of PO2. Not a lot. Fortunately, Mother Nature also invented hemoglobin. So the oxygen bound to hemoglobin is 1.34 mLs per gram of 100% saturated hemoglobin in blood. So most oxygen is carried on hemoglobin. Unfortunately, the relationship of O2 saturation to hemoglobin versus PO2 is not linear, as you can see here. Nobody memorizes this curve, but uh, you should can have it available. The P50 is the partial pressure at which uh, hemoglobin is 50% saturated. And it's about uh, 26 in, um, in normal individuals. This relationship, however, can shift. So this can shift to the left. In this case, it means that hemoglobin affinity for oxygen is increased. At the same PO2, we have a greater saturation. But there's decreased tissue delivery. So left shift is caused by decreased temperature, alkalosis, and decreased CO2. That will shift this to the left, or increase the amount of oxygen on hemoglobin. A right shift decreases the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. You can see at the same PO2, there's less saturation than in the baseline, but it increases O2 tissue delivery. The right shift is caused by increased temperature, acidosis, increased PCO2, or increased 2,3 DPG, which increases in red cells with chronic CO2 retention. This is work by Barcroft uh, in 1909, 1910, where he attempted to look at the magnitude of these effects. And I think what you can see is that um, PO, PCO2 does move this curve back and forth some, pH moves it back and forth some, but temperature actually has the greatest effect in terms of moving 
the location of this oxyhemoglobin dissociation. We can calculate the O2 content of blood. So content of arterial um, blood for oxygen, okay? It's going to equal 1.34, the number of mLs of blood in a fully saturated hemoglobin times grams hemoglobin per deciliter times the percent saturation, plus what's dissolved, which is 0 0.003 times the PO2. So let's calculate for arterial blood. It's going to be 1.34. Let's assume a hemoglobin of 15 instead of 100. So 1.34 times 15 times 1 plus 100 times 0 0.003. So 20.1 mLs is carried in hemoglobin. Only 0.3 is carried um, saturated. And that gives us a total of 20.4 mLs. Oxygen content of mixed venous blood, that is blood returning to the lungs after uh, oxygen has been extracted for metabolism. Same thing, but now we're talking about 1.34 times 15 times a normal mixed venous saturation of 75%. All right, so that's going to give us 15.1. And uh, dissolved is a normal uh, mixed venous PO2 of 40 times 0.3 is 0.1. So mixed venous blood content is 15.2. So this is the physiologic working range. This is what we calculated for our arterial blood. This is mixed venous blood. So we have a lot of reserve here. And this reserve really is used if somebody is stressing the system, exercise or critical illness, where you might have to dip down and extract more oxygen um, off of hemoglobin, for example, than in the normal situation. But as those of you who are listening to this uh, presentation um, sit here, you're basically moving your uh, hemoglobin back and forth between this range of your arterial blood and mixed venous blood. O2 content of blood is also dependent on two other things, the amount of hemoglobin. So if you're anemic, decreased hemoglobin will decrease O2 content in blood, even if the saturation is 100%. Similarly, substances that uh, displace oxygen from hemoglobin, most commonly carbon monoxide, all right, interferes with binding of hemoglobin, of oxygen to hemoglobin, sorry, all right? So this will decrease the content. Now, both of these decrease O2 content, but the PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen, is unchanged, it's the same. So somebody can be anemic, have a normal PO2, but still have decreased oxygen delivery to tissues because O2 content is down. Carbon monoxide actually is classically associated with a cherry red appearance because you don't have cyanosis. You, in fact, have normal PO2 um, in, in addition, even though some of that oxygen is displaced by carbon monoxide. So this is just visually. Now, what's plotted here is not percent sat, but total content. So this would be the normal individual. Here would be someone's anemic, let's say 50%. The curve looks the same. It just doesn't go up as far not as much hemoglobin to carry it, and a 50% carboxyhemoglobin, which would probably be fatal, but if it were present, would have a curve like this. CO2. So CO2, about 10% is dissolved. About 30% is bound to hemoglobin, and most of it is actually carried as carbonic acid. So this chemical formula, water plus CO2, forms carbonic acid, which dissociates to hydrogen ion, which is acid, and bicarb, which generally is, is combined with sodium. Fortunately, the CO2 content versus PCO2 is in fact linear in the physiologic range. Now note it does change with oxygenation, which we'll talk about in just a second, but it's essentially linear. So when we think about O2 con CO2 content in blood, we can actually substitute PCO2 because they're linearly related. So there is a Bohr effect. The Bohr effect means that CO2 and acidosis decrease hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. And the Haldane effect, O2 decreases hemoglobin, hemoglobin affinity for CO2. So CO2 and O2 content, there is interdependence of those two. Let's follow for the moment a red blood cell through the circulation. In the lungs, there's cool temperature which causes an increased oxygen affinity for, um, for hemoglobin. This increased affinity causes decreased CO2 affinity, so CO2 can be exhaled. Decreased CO2 is alkaline, 
which increases O2 affinity. So R2 blood has an increased O2, has increased O2, decreased temperature, decreased CO2, and increased pH have moved the oxygen blood association curve. Okay. In the tissue, that should be RBC, sorry. There are high temperatures, decreased oxygen affinity, thus O2 is delivered to the tissues. Decreased O2 causes increased CO2 affinity, so CO2 is removed from tissues. Increased CO2 is acid, which further decreases O2 affinity, so venous blood has decreased oxygen and increased CO2. The increased temperature, increased CO2, and decreased pH move the oxygen living association curve in this direction, which basically increases O2 tissue delivery. So just to recap, in the lungs, the curve is, is moved this direction, increasing affinity. Oxygen is picked up. In the tissues, it's moved this direction, which improves oxygen tissue delivery. To summarize this, 95% of oxygen in blood is bound to hemoglobin. The relationship of oxygen bound to hemoglobin and PO2 is nonlinear. The relationship of CO2 content to PCO2 in blood is nearly linear. Cyanosis. This, of course, is a blue color. It's a blue color that's seen in the lips and finger, fingernails associated with hypoxia. It's seen when there are five grams per deciliter of unsaturated hemoglobin. So normal mixed venous O2 is 75%. So for a normal hemoglobin of 15, there will be only 3.5 grams per deciliter of unsaturated venous blood that is no cyanosis. So most of the blood that you see in skin is actually venous blood. And that's the physiologic working range there. However, if we had lung disease, where the, D, the O2 is, is, uh, is reduced, and let's assume for a moment a PO2 of less than 60, um, then the, the saturation would be less than 89. Let's assume there's still an AAO2 difference here of saturation of 25%, then the mixed venous O2 would be less than 64. And in fact, this would be the way this would look. And in fact, in this individual, this would cause greater than five grams per deciliter of unsaturated hemoglobin, and cyanosis will be observed. Note that cyanosis may not be seen in anemia, where there's decreased hemoglobin, even if someone's hypoxic. And it may be seen in a rare disorder called polycythemia rubra vera, where hemoglobin can often reach 20 grams per deciliter, and this, these patients will show cyanosis even though they're normal oxic. So it's a reasonably good clinical sign if you see it, but it doesn't necessarily mean somebody is not hypoxic if you don't. All right, finally for today, let's talk about oxygen and CO2 diffusion. O2 and CO2 transport across the alveolar capillary membrane is by passive diffusion. There is no active transport of oxygen or CO2 and CO2 is much more diffusible. So the situation we have is that mixed venous blood comes into the uh, alveolus or, or alveolar pulmonary capillary with a PO2 of 40, PCO2 of 46. The gas exchange occurs, all right? And blood leaves in the pulmonary vein pretty nearly fully oxygenated with an arterial PO2 of around 98 and a PCO2 of 40. What are the barriers to diffusion? All right, so if we have an alveolus here, oxygen has to cross epithelial layer, interstitial space, endothelial layer, and get into the red cell. There's potentially um, some degree of uh, resistance of diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane. And then there's some in the blood, the chemical reaction that's required um, to, for oxygen to combine with hemoglobin and the amount of hemoglobin in the blood itself. Oxygen transport can be limited from the alveolus to the pulmonary capillary in two ways, so-called diffusion limitation or perfusion limitation. Diffusion limited gas exchange is characterized by incomplete equilibration between alveolar and pulmonary capillary PO2. The rate of gas diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane limits its transport. So the limit is in the alveolar capillary membrane. And um, O2 Gas transport is diffusion limited at extreme altitude. So again, slow equilibration. Perfusion limited gas exchange is characterized by complete equilibration between alveolar and pulmonary capillary PO2.
So gas transport is limited by perfusion, that is the amount of hemoglobin in the lung to receive oxygen. Gas transport then in normals is perfusion limited at sea level. There's a quick equilibration um, between alveolar and capillary PO2. In normal lungs, O2 gas transport is perfusion limited at sea level, right? There's equilibration between the alveolar and end capillary O2 long before the red blood cell exits the alveolar pulmonary capillary membrane. And therefore, there is no significant impediment to oxygen diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane. And this is what it looks like. So PO2 coming in, mixed venous, in the pulmonary capillary rapidly gets to the point where it equals the alveolar capillary level. All right. Um, so more diffusion can occur because hemoglobin is already fully saturated at this point in time. The only way you'd get more hemoglobin in would be to increase the amount of hemoglobin. So one could increase diffusion by increasing oxygen uptake, increasing hemoglobin, increasing cardiac output. But in normal lungs, increasing the PiO2, that is breathing supplemental oxygen, will have no effect on oxygen diffusion because that hemoglobin was already 100% saturated breathing room air. If you have abnormal lungs and you're hypoxic at rest, then obviously these things will still increase it. But then increasing the amount of oxygen you're breathing can increase diffusion if it increases the O2 saturation of hemoglobin, but not if you're normal. There is no significant impediment to oxygen diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane. Thus, a thickened alveolar capillary membrane, as in pulmonary fibrosis, does not significantly affect diffusion. There are no diffusion defects described in animals or man which cause hypoxia at rest. Hypoxia can be explained in these conditions by pulmonary mechanics, and one need not hypothesize an additional diffusion defect. We could, however, bring out a diffusion defect by stressing the system. So if we exercise somebody, we decrease the amount of time that the uh, red cell is in the pulmonary capillary. And if we go to high altitude, we decrease the diffusion gradient so that, in fact, in these situations, the diffusion defect might be brought out clinically. But at rest, again, no diffusion defects in animals or man, which cause hypoxia. So in normal lungs, O2 gas transport is perfusion limited at sea level. However, as one ascends in elevation, O2 gas transport becomes more diffusion limited. At the summit of Mount Everest, for example, O2 gas transport is completely diffusion limited because of the very low diffusion gradient. And in fact, we can kind of view this like this. This is sea level. This is Mount Everest. From actual data and as we go to higher altitudes basically gas exchange becomes more diffusion limited. CO2. So CO2 is much more diffusible than um, oxygen. Note that about the same amount of gas um, diffuses as uh, you know for CO2 and O2 but the diffusion gradient for CO2 is only 6 torr compared to 60 torr for oxygen. So diffusion for CO2 is much, much more robust, and nobody has ever postulated a diffusion defect for CO2. So this is the case again for diffusion that we've talked about that occurs here, and diffusion is nearly complete. Normal lung function is the maintenance of normal arterial PO2, CO2, and pH without excessive cardiac or pulmonary work. Nearly all oxygen is transported on hemoglobin in blood, <clears throat> but oxygen saturation of hemoglobin is not linear with respect to PCO2. Most CO2 is transported as carbonic acid in blood. Carbon dioxide content of blood is nearly linear with respect to PCO2. The diffusion of oxygen is not limited by the alveolar capillary membrane, that is diffusion limited, all right? It is limited by the amount of hemoglobin to pick up oxygen, which is perfusion limited. So next time we will begin to talk about gas exchange and VQ. Um, thanks to our producer and director, Katie LeWinter, and uh, thank you very much.